Okay, so last time I introduced you to the fungi, and uh, today we're going to look into more of the diversity of fungi. Um, these are the most closely related organisms to us that we're going to talk about in this course, which may seem a little strange. They're still, it's still been a billion years since we shared a common ancestor. But uh, as I pointed out last time, they show some interesting similarities to animals and some features that are completely bizarre and different that we're going to talk a little bit more about today as we go through these different groups of uh, fungi. So last time, remember at the end, I just introduced you to the chytrids, which um, are one, the only group that has motile uh, stages in the life cycle that actually have a whip-like flagellum that they can get around with or spores. And uh, that flagellum is very similar to the one, for example, in human sperm. It's uh, something that we share due to common ancestry with fungi. Uh, we're all called unicons, which isn't a term you have to know, as I mentioned, but um, there are some features in addition to that. For example, the storage, the uh, way we store our carbon is glycogen that we share with fungi as well. And uh, the chytrids were the first group that we talked about. We'll go through these other groups, then I'll get into the life cycle of fungi. We'll talk about life cycles in general so that you have a little bit better understanding of what that's all about, because we'll, be, we'll keep coming back to life cycles as we look at different organisms. And then the importance of fungi ecologically and economically. And I don't believe we'll have time to get to algae today, but um, we'll get into that right away next time. So after today's lecture, we'll be talking about photosynthetic organisms for the rest of this part of the course. Okay, so I showed you this tree last time, and uh, this is a phylogenetic tree laying on its side with the root right here. So that's the base of the tree, and here are the five major phyla these major clades of fungi that have been recognized. And the chytrids we talked about last time um, here. So now we're going to focus in on these four major phyla, which are the fungi that have always been recognized as fungi. These are very, um, they share the features we find across uh, the, the main part of the group. And there hasn't been dispute about their position. Whereas the chytrids, I may have mentioned, have been considered protists at various times. They haven't been necessarily recognized as fungi. And that's consistent with their early branching within the fungal tree of life. They have some features that they share with the rest of the fungi and some features that are a little different that they've inherited from a common ancestry with other um, more distantly related groups. So let's first look at uh, this zygomycota which you're probably familiar with if you haven't been all that careful about your refrigerator and uh, cleaning it out once in a while because uh, the common black bread mold and some of these molds that attack produce like strawberries and peaches um, are probably familiar friends of yours. And um, these are the hyphae that you see here. They look, you know, we, we often are grossed out by these things, but if you look at them very closely under a microscope, they're really fascinating and beautiful. But uh, the zygomycota are named this because, well, mycota, again, means fungus. The zygo, you're probably familiar with that from zygote, the, the product of the fusion of gametes. But in the case of this group, it's actually called that because of what's called the zygosporangium, which is a unique structure. You won't see this term used again for other groups. It's this resistant body here, which forms from the fusion of gametangia so rather than the gametes themselves fusing together, like sperm and egg, in this case, the actual sacs that bear the, the gametes fuse together, or these sexual hyphae fuse together, and the, the two gametangia become this zygosporangium within which um, we have fusion of the nuclei to produce diploid nuclei, um, basically uh, meiosis immediately following that to produce sexual spores. And we'll get into the life cycles here in a minute, so don't worry too much about meiosis and, and all. But the sexual spores are, are produced inside the structure. And it doesn't produce, members of this group don't produce a big showy fruiting body like a mushroom. We don't get 
big sizable um, fruiting bodies. This is the, the main sexual structure that's formed, and this is a very tiny little structure. This is a microscopic view here. Um, and typically, these things are reproducing largely by asexual spores and uh, produced by sporangia where mitosis is occurring rather than meiosis. And uh, those are responsible in part for a lot of the, the dark coloration that you see in these uh, mycelia that infect your food. And the uh, asexual sporangia of these groups can be really densely packed. Uh, this is a pilobolus. In class, you'll see physarum, the uh, bread mold. And uh, these are tiny, but they actually can eject their spores explosively for about two meters. And if you put that in perspective, if a, a flowering plant here in town had that kind of dispersal capability, it'd be shooting its seeds all the way, acro way across the city. I mean, this is a hugely uh, dispersive group. They can shoot their spores a long distance away from the parent and so these can colonize new substrates where they're not going to compete with their parent mycelium really effectively. So these guys are, are masters of dispersal. That's all I'm going to really say about the zygomycota. It's not as diverse a group as, the, as some of these uh, so-called higher fungi that produce the large um, fruiting bodies. We'll get to those in a minute. This is a group that used to be considered part of the zygomycota. And its position's been a little questionable phylogenetically because there's no sexual structures known in this group. There aren't, there's no sex that's been documented. And without the sexual structures, it's often difficult to identify organisms, um, botanical organisms. Um, they do reproduce asexually, and you can see some spores here that have been produced asexually. Uh, this is a group of very low diversity that's known. There are only a couple hundred species described. And I think I mentioned last time, there are over 100,000 known fungal species. But this is one of the most important groups of fungi from the standpoint of life on Earth, because these are the ones that form those arbuscular mycorrhizal associations with plant roots. Remember, we talked about two different types of mycorrhizae last time, these associations between plant roots and fungi. There were the ectomycorrhizae that don't penetrate the cell walls. And then there were the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that do penetrate the cell walls of the roots. They don't penetrate the cell membranes, remember. They're just, their they're hyphae spread out over the cell membrane of the cell roots. And here you can see that, this tree-like branching. You can see it, I think, really beautifully here in this scanning electron micrograph of a um, arbuscule, as it's called, this tree-like structure of the mycorrhizal fungus that's in contact with the cell membrane of the root. And this allows for really, uh, for, for a, a, a lot of surface area in contact between the, the fungus and the root where exchange of, of carbohydrates to the fungus and inorganic nutrients to the plant occur. And so this group, even though it's not known to be very diverse, only a couple hundred species, associates with the vast majority of land plants, uh, more than 80% of land plant families uh, have this association. And this includes some of the really early diverging lineages. So, and there's actually the, the oldest fossil fungi that are known come from this group. They go back over 450 million years. And so this group was around, we know based on, fungi, uh, based on the fossils, it was around before the land plant, or before at least the vascular plants began to diversify in a major way. And they probably were key to the success of the land plants because this association is so widespread. And as I'll show you later, it's really important to the uh, performance of land plants. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the fungi that have large fruiting bodies, the ones you're more familiar with. And the two major groups here are sister to one another. They're each other's closest relatives. The most diverse one is not the one that includes the true mushrooms, but the ascomycota. These are the sac fungi. And um, they include about 65,000 species. I mean, the number's not important, but more than half of all known fungi belong to this group. 
And uh, they have a wide diversity of different lifestyles. This is a really diverse group in terms of the way they make their living. But they all share this feature of these distinctive sacs um, called an ascus. Here's an individual ascus right here. It's this membranous sac. I mean, ascus literally means skin sac because the outside of it is membranous or skin-like. And that's where syngamy occurs, or I should say where the nuclei fusion occurs, associated the final stage of fertilization, and then we have meiosis leading to production of sexual spores. And usually one mitosis as well, which is why you typically have eight spores rather than four. We'll get to, to meiosis again in a moment though. But this is where the sexual spores are formed. And these are distinctive throughout the whole group. You can find this kind of a structure bearing the sexual spores. And they're born on the surface of these depressions. So you can see in this morel, which includes some um, choice edibles, not all of them are choice, um, but some of them are choice edibles. You have these depressions in the fruiting body. And you can see this depressed summit to this uh, fruiting body here. The fruiting bodies are called ascocarps. Carp just refers to fruit. I mean, when we get technical about it, fungi don't really produce fruit. Fruit is something that only flowering plants produce, but that's the, the lay term that's used, the term that's typically used in the vernacular for the fruiting, the, for the uh, bodies that produce the, the sexual spores. And um, so these inner surfaces here lined with these ascites are called that uh, produce the, the spores. And one of the things about these, these fungi that produce these larger fruiting bodies is the ascomycetes and the basidiomycetes that make up the 90% you know, of the known fungi is that they have these septate hyphae that I talked about last time. So the zygomycetes and the glomeromycetes and the chytrids, those are the bread molds and the chytrids and those arbuscular fungi have these open cenocytic hyphae they don't have any septi within them. So you have nuclear divisions going on. The nuclei divide, but we don't have cell membranes uh, walling them off from one another. Here we have uh, septi forming that are, remember, just partial. There's cytoplasm can flow through here, but larger particles like nuclei can't. And this is characteristic of both the ascomycota and the basidiomycota, and it's probably something that they share due to common ancestry. And this would be then the ancestral situation within fungi because we see it in the chytrids that have hyphae and in the zygomycota and the glomeromycota. So this is a innovation here, these septi. Okay, so some of the, a lot of the ascomycota and a few basidiomycota actually um, include these unicellular organisms that we refer to as yeasts. And there's this popular misconception that yeast is one thing. And that's understandable because the, the yeast that we use for brewing alcohol and or for, for fermenting uh, alcohol fermentation and for baking bread are, is the same species, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. But there's about a thousand, over a thousand described species of yeast. For example, the yeast that causes uh, yeast infections is a completely different yeast. And there's nothing to this whole notion that women that have yeast infections shouldn't eat, their, uh, shouldn't eat um, food with yeast in it because they're not closely related. But that's a very diverse group. And it's underrepresented by our taxonomy, no doubt, because uh, these things have very few morphological characters. Um, and uh, the molecular data is showing that there's a, probably 10 times the diversity we actually recognize here. And some of these ascomycetes can go into an asexual life cycle, non-sexual life cycle that involves uh, yeasts, but they can also have a sexual life, or I should say, some of the yeasts have both sexual and asexual life cycles, but typically they reproduce by budding. And you can see that budding going on here. This is a highly magnified view. So they're just undergoing mitosis, basically clonal reproduction where uh, one organism give, gives rise to two identical organisms. And they can, of course, reproduce really quickly. And um, we take advantage of that in brewing and baking. 
Okay, so that's fiasco mycota. So now finally the basidio mycota. This is the group that's probably most familiar to you because it includes the true mushrooms as well as what you, you've probably seen puffballs before and bracket fungi growing on wood. I'll show you an example of that later. Um, these are, are all called club fungi and that's because the structure that produces the sexual spores um, looks sort of club-like if you use your imagination. I'll show you that in a minute. But um, there's a wide diversity of different types of fruiting bodies here, but they all produce what's called a basidium or this club that produces the spores. We'll get to it. Um, in addition to the fungi in this group that produce these large um, fruiting bodies, we also have some bizarre things like the jelly fungi that produce these weird jelly-like uh, um, fruiting bodies, and they're not so distantly related to rusts and smuts. And rusts and smuts are, um, they, have, they have very small bodies, they're essentially microscopic, and they're really important uh, pathogens, especially with plants, and uh, cause a huge amount of uh, economic damage and ecosystem damage in some cases, but they're important parts of the ecosystem. It's when they get introduced where they don't belong that they really cause the most trouble. But if you've heard of rust and smut, uh, those organisms, this is, they're part of the same group. We won't really get into them anymore. So the, the mycelium, uh, which is the fungus body, literally means fungus body, the mycelium of basidiomycetes can be really extensive underground. And you're just seeing sort of the tip of the iceberg when they actually go to reproductive state like this. A lot of people think the mushroom is the main body of the fungus, but it's just the reproductive body. It's just getting its spores dispersed out into the atmosphere this way. But uh, in order to feed, it needs to be in a situation where it's surrounded by food, which um, is, a, is typically underground. And these basidiocarps are produced around the leading edge of that mycelium. So when the Mycelium starts to really grow out and it grows out, uh, it radiates out like spokes of a wheel and basically fills all the space in there, um, taking advantage of all the resources. And about at a rate of a roughly 30 centimeters a year or so, it's moving outward in all directions typically, such that uh, when it goes to produce its basidiocarps, which is the name of the, which literally means the fruiting body that produces a basidium where the spores are born. These fruiting bodies are, are in a ring, which uh, in ancient times was thought to have some mystical significance, often called fairy rings. And um, you can see basically the size of this mycelium by um, considering that everything internal to this ring is basically the mycelium underground. So, um, the production of the fruiting bodies out here at the periphery is advantageous because that's where resources are richest, where they haven't been exploited by the fungus. So it needs to mobilize a lot of resources quickly to these fruiting bodies, which form overnight usually, just in a few hours. So the mycelium is, um, it's advantageous for the mycelium to do that out around the periphery here where it hasn't exploited all the resources. And so um, people have gone in and looked at these fungi um, doing genetic tests of mycelia across different areas and, fun and fungal fruiting bodies across wide areas and have come to realize that some of the mycelia that are out there are absolutely huge. You can do genetic fingerprinting and determine that uh, fruiting bodies that are widely scattered on the environment are genetically identical and the, um, the evidence indicates that some of these mycelia that are producing these widely scattered identical fruiting bodies probably cover areas of you know, more than nearly 2,000 acres. Six and a half square miles is the estimate for the largest one known. And that they actually estimate the size of some of these at hundreds of tons of uh, hyphae and an age of thousands of years given their known rate of growth. And so, of course, some of the communities that have uh, found out that some of their local fungi uh, represent such ancient and huge 
organisms have tried to take advantage of this to attract tourists, and you can see some of the uh, efforts here in Michigan and Pacific Northwest, but uh, as you can imagine, you know, people are generally disappointed if they go to these places looking for the giant mushroom, expecting to find a fungal fruiting body the size of a giant sequoia or something like that, because that's not, not where the uh, biomass is located. So I've never been to one of these festivals. If any, anybody has or, wants, or does go to one, I'd like to hear about it. Okay, finally, um, there's a group that isn't on that tree that I showed you, but it is a recognized phylum called the Deuteromycota. And um, this is literally the fungi imperfecti. And imperfect doesn't refer to bad here or somehow flawed, but they're not sexual. Okay, so they only reproduce asexually. So, I mean, I guess there's some kind of assumption that if you're not capable of sexual reproduction that, and you can only reproduce asexually that, you're, that things aren't absolutely perfect. But these actually are very successful groups and they include some really important ones like penicillium, our source of penicillin. And um, even though now, so back maybe 20 years ago, this was actually a group that included a lot of fungi, but uh, mycologists have gone in and with molecular techniques have been able to, us to determine the phylogenetic position of a lot of these imperfect fungi with DNA. Uh, when they didn't have the sexual structures and they're having to rely on morphology, just on the form of these things, that wasn't possible. So the positions of these are mostly known now, and they're mostly, these asexual fungi are mostly in the ascomycota, some are in the basidiomycota. Um, but this group is actually maintained as a taxonomic group because uh, the mycologists want to continue to recognize um, this group in an ecological sense because they share this asexual life history. So uh, it's an interesting case of where organisms are being described in a couple of different kind of parallel systems. I mean, that's, that's really a, an aside, but I just wanted to point out that there are a lot of fungi that don't reproduce sexually, and um, some of these are quite successful. Okay, so now in class, in lab this week, you're gonna see a couple of groups that we used to think we're fungi, but now we know we're not fungi. And this particular one, the oomycota, remember mycota means fungus, we th um, is not in fact a fungus. Uh, and these are called the water molds, even though they can occur in terrestrial habitats as well, not just in aquatic habitats. And um, these turn out to be more closely related to some algae, and in particular, some of the kelps the, the brown algae and the diatoms. We'll get to those later. Um, but this is a group that you can see produces hyphae, these filamentous structures that look a lot like the hyphae of fungi. But these hyphae are diploid. They're not haploid. All fungal hyphae, as I should say, the uh, nuclei of fungal hyphae are haploid, whereas the nuclei of these hyphae are diploid. Uh, like our, the cells in our body. And in fact, the only haploid stage in this group are the gametes, just like in us. And in fact, their gametes look a lot like ours. These guys have sperm and eggs that they have uh, free swimming sperm and they have larger uh, non-motile eggs. That's the basis for the name oomycota, the egg fungi. Um, so they're very different. It's long been recognized that they're pretty, pretty bizarre, pretty different from most other fungi. And, it, and the reason is because they're not fungi. And they include some really destructive pathogens. Um, you've probably heard of the Irish potato famine in the mid-1800s. This was caused by a member of the genus Phytophthora. The genus name's unimportant, but this particular group the old mycota include many species of this genus, which are some of the worst plant pathogens that we know of. And um, they led to, led to widespread starvation in Ireland and a mass immigration to other parts of the world because of the destruction of the potatoes by that, um, by that water mold. And here in the Bay Area, we have an ongoing, uh, ongoing crisis with this organism called Phytophthora remorum, which causes a sudden oak death. 
which has only been known for a little over, not even 15 years, here in the Bay Area, Marin County was where it was first discovered, and you can see some dead oaks here. Our native pan oak, which is a really central tree to our uh, mixed evergreen forest, is dying out throughout its range. It may go extinct within the next 50 years, and uh, it's endemic here to the West Coast. And the coast live oak, which is a real iconic plant in California, and it's one of the widely planted uh, oaks here on campus, is also a victim of this water mold. And uh, fortunately, there is some resistance in it, but, but a lot of the, there's been tens of thousands of coast live oaks that have died over the last few years because of this organism. And, and the list goes on and on of phytopsorists that are destructive. But, uh, you know, these disease-causing organisms that cause extinctions are typically ones that are non-native to the area where they're causing that kind of destruction. You probably, may, you may have been, talked about this in ecology, but diseases typically don't cause their hosts to go extinct. That would be uh, greatly disadvantaged to the disease-causing organism too. Okay, so this is one of the coolest groups of organisms that we're gonna see in this class. And uh, these are the, the cute and cuddly slime molds, which um, people actually love to keep as pets because they are so bizarre and interesting. And they actually have beautiful coloration, as you can see here in many cases. These are things that used to be thought to be fungi, but it turns out they're no more closely related to fungi than they are to animals. So you have as much in common with these things as the fungi do, as big a claim to a, re a relationship. And um, they start out as a spore. The spore germinates and becomes an amoeboid organism. And you're probably familiar with the blob, you know, that amoeba-like thing that moves along and can engulf small particles and digest them and uh, is motile. Um, not, and, and in this case, it's mo it can move along sort of creeping along, or it can uh, move along by flagelli, by a whip-like uh, flagellum here. And um, these are unicons, like fungi and, 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 and animals, with a single whip-like flagellum. And they can go interchangeably between these stages. And when two mating types get together, these amoeboid, or what they're called swarm cells here, they can fuse together to form a zygote. And once that zygote is formed, then this thing starts undergoing uh, mitosis. You get nuclear divisions one after the other, but that's not accompanied by any kind of cell membrane formation to separate off those nuclei from one another. And you just continue to get uh, enlargement of this gigantic cellular-like structure. It's like one big open cell full of nuclei that uh, turns into this big, um, mat or sheet, which is called a plasmodium. Um, this big slimy mass that just moves along and uh, digests with, you know, whatever it, can, it encounters as it's radiating out. You can see one out here as it's moving out in search of food. And it can digest things like spores or bacteria, little particles that it engulfs. And while this is happening, the if you look at this thing closely, uh, within these vein-like structures, you can see the, the, the cytoplasm streaming one way and then the next. So here's, here's what that looks like. I don't know if you can see it very well. It's a little hard to see, but you can see some little droplets here, these food bodies moving along as it climbs, as the cytoplasm moves through this thing. It'll go one direction and the next. Presumably it's moving nutrients and oxygen around. And uh, it's pretty mesmerizing to watch it, actually. It's pre they're pretty neat. And then when they finally run out of food or if the climate goes to their dis to, uh, go gets foul for them, if it gets cold, for example, they'll start to harden and produce sporangia like this. And then the life cycle starts over again. But if you keep feeding them, you know, with Quaker's oats or whatever, and um, you can get a fairly large pet, you know, and people do like to keep these things. You can find them out in, um, on leaf litter and on uh, tree stems, on, on, uh, on tree branches and such, just out in the local um, mixed evergreen forest here in the Bay Area. We have a lot of diversity of these things. 
but most people just completely overlook them and don't know that they're there, but it's, it's, they're really something else. Okay, so now I want to get into life cycles. And um, in order to really understand these botanical organisms, the fungi and, and the real plants and the algae, you really have to understand their whole life history. And the life history of these things is quite different from that of you and me. And I know if you've had zoology, if you took bio 1A and you think you can talk about life histories of animals, that's pretty relatable because we're all adults here and we all know about the birds and the bees. Um, that's not something that you've just been introduced to, hopefully. But you definitely uh, don't necessarily know about what, what sex is like for fungi and plants. And in order to really understand life cycles, you have to understand what sex is at the most fundamental level, okay? And we can get away with not knowing that when we're thinking about animals, but we cannot get away with that when we're talking about fungi and plants. So to be a real expert in sexual reproduction, you have to really think about it in this broad, fundamental sense. And uh, that, so basically, sexual reproduction, when you get right down to the nitty gritty, the real fundamental element, there are two things that have to occur. Okay, one of them is fertilization or syngamy, where the gametes, we have the production of gametes, and uh, these are haploid with one set of chromosomes, and they fuse, undergo this process of fertilization or syngamy, which syn just refers to fusion. It's used a lot in a lot of terminology. Syn and gamete, of course, refers to the gametes. Uh, fertilization occurs to form a zygote which is a product of gametic fusion, which is a diploid um, structure from which, um, well, let's just put, leave it there. I think we all know this part of the process. Um, sperm and eggs are gametes, and they fuse together to form a zygote. Okay, so that's probably not so, so alien. Uh, meiosis, though, is something that I'm sure you've heard about if you had high school biology, or um, I'm sure it was discussed in the evolution part of this course as well. But it's the other essential ingredient. Uh, meiosis and fertilization are the two components of sex when it really comes down to it. And meiosis is the process. OK, let's first make a distinction here with mitosis. Mitosis is the process leading to the production of two um, progeny cells from an original cell that are genetically identical. So the kind of cell division that leads to the for, for example, in animals, leads to the zygote eventually becoming an adult person. Those cell divisions are, are mitotic because all the cells in our body are genetically identical, right? Those are clonal. We're just getting one uh, round of DNA replication followed by division and uh, one, set of one set of chromosomes going, or, or uh, identical chromosomes going to each pole so that we end up with identical cells. Meiosis is completely different than that. Okay, meiosis also involves one round of DNA replication, but then we have crossing over between each of the, the, the uh, chromosomes that were inherited from the two different parents. So we have recombination between the parental chromosomes that, for example, we inherited from our mother and our father. Those chromosomes each of, the, your, each of your mother's chromosomes uh, can, uh, associates with each of your father's chromosomes and homologous pairs, and there's recombination between them. And then we have two rounds, not one round of cell division like in mitosis. In meiosis, there are two rounds of cell division. Ultimately, then we get four cells, each with only one set of chromosomes rather than the two sets that we have in our body, most of our body. So that's the haploid condition with one set or one end condition as opposed to two ends. Okay, so in the end, we have, we end up, it's often emphasized that this is the way to go from diploid to haploid, which we have to, which has to occur during the sexual life cycle. But just as importantly, within that haploid cell, you have a unique 
assemblage of genes because the chromosomes between your mother and your father have recombined. And so except for the Y chromosome in men, which is handed down faithfully from one generation to the next, it doesn't undergo recombination with another chromosome. The other chromosomes are undergoing um, recombination between them. So this is the way genetic variation is, is um, generated. We also have independent assortments of the two poles. So it's a, um, we end up with recombined chromosomes of one set. Okay, so is that clear to everybody? That's, that's an essential thing to realize about, that's all organisms that have sexual life cycles alternate meiosis and fertilization. So here you can see an animal life cycle like ours. Here you can see a plant life cycle and here you can see a fungal life cycle on the right. Let's just focus on the, the animals and the fungi for a minute. We'll get to plants later. So as I said, sexual life cycles of all meiosis and fertilization. And the way that they differ from one another, these sexual life cycles, is in the relative timing of meiosis and fertilization, okay? When these two processes occur relative to one another. And so in animals, you can see that, we, as you know, like in us, um, fertilization, I should say meiosis uh, to produce gametes is immediately followed by fertilization. There are no mitoses in that process. We have meiosis giving rise to gametes directly, and then we have fertilization giving rise to the zygote, and then we have a lot of mitoses to make the animal body, okay? So the gamete is the only haploid stage. Meiosis immediately followed by fertilization. So in the case of fungi, it's almost the opposite. We have fertilization giving rise to a zygote immediately followed by meiosis to give rise to spores that germinate to become the haploid fungal body. Okay, so in this case, it's the other way around. The, fun the fertilization happens uh, and then we immediately get meiosis. So the zygote is the only diploid stage. So uh, and whereas here, the uh, gamete was the only haploid stage. Let's make a distinction now between gametes and spores. This is something I think it get peop gets people confused. A spore is just a unicellular reproductive structure that germinates to become an organism. So it actually, mitoses occur and you get a, an organism. Gametes are unicellular reproductive structures too, but they undergo fusion with one another to produce a zygote. So there's a distinction there. Um, we'll be talking about gametes and spores a lot during the rest of the course. But just remember, gametes fuse, spores don't fuse with one another. Um, spores go, go ahead and directly germinate. Okay, so the relative timing of meiosis and fertilization, when we get to plants, um, I'll point out that in plants, we actually have a body, an organism, a body formed in this diploid stage as well as in the haploid stage. And that's a bizarre concept for a human to think about, for an animal to think about, or even maybe for a fungus to think about if it could, uh, because that's a strange concept that in one species you would have two different kinds of organisms, one that's haploid and one that's diploid, and they alternate between one another. We get this alternation of generations. But that's not the case in animals and fungi, and we'll stick with fungi for the moment. And so as I mentioned, whether, mito whether mitosis is limited, so another way in which you differentiate these life cycles is whether mitosis, this clonal reproduction of cells, is limited to one of the two stages, the haploid stage here, or the diploid stage here, uh, helps to distinguish these life cycles, uh, or whether it occurs in both in the case of plants. So that's, those are things to, to bear in mind and please try to absorb this as soon as possible in terms of trying to think about these life cycles uh, or else you can get hopelessly confused. It becomes pretty esoteric to talk about life cycles. You don't keep in mind these major things, life cycles all involved, 
a diploid phase, a diploid stage, I should say, a haploid stage, and we alternate between those by fertilization and meiosis. So here's the fungal life cycle. Um, I, I should say this is a life cycle that is common to most fungi. Um, and by most, I'm referring to the ascomycota and the basidiomycota, which are over 90% of the known fungal species. These are the ones that produce the larger fruiting bodies many times. So um, here you can see an asexual cycle. So here we have spore production by meiosis. As I mentioned, the zygote being the only diploid stage in this life cycle, the zygote. A meiosis immediately following that to give haploid spores, which germinate. Remember, spores don't fuse to one another. They germinate to become a haploid fungal body or mycelium. And then we can have production by mitosis of genetically identical spores. And you can see some here that uh, can then germinate and give a genetically identical mycelium to the one that generated the spores. That happens a lot, as I mentioned, in those asexual fungi imperfecti. And in yeast, et cetera, we see that. But there's also a sexual life cycle over here. And what happens here in these higher fungi that's a little bit of a wrinkle in this whole thing that is easy to comprehend when you think about it is that the fertilization process, this one that we all think we're familiar with of sperm and egg coming together, gametes coming together, this is done in two phases in the fungi. So in the fungi, we have first the, the fusion of the cytoplasm. So we'll have these hyphae come together and fuse together. Uh, so they have a common cytoplasm, but their nuclei don't fuse together right away. So normally when you form a zygote, you get cytoplasmic fusion and the nuclei form, uh, fuse right away too. And the, the nuclear contents are in one structure, but here, we have what's called a dikaryotic stage, and that means two, two nuclei. So in each one of those cellular partitions in these septate hyphae, we have, the, we have each of the parent nuclei remaining separate. And then eventually, in specialized cells, we have the fusion of those nuclei to form the zygote. But this dikaryotic stage can be very extended. And during that stage, you could have complex uh, genetic expression. It's just that the nuclei are not fused together. So here, let me just put this in a little bit more, con or show you an actual example from the true fungi. So here's a basidio mycota life cycle from your book. So we start out over here with a spore that was formed from meiosis, a sexual spore that's haploid. It undergoes germination and we get faithful mitoses here, producing a bunch of genetically identical cells. This, this is a typical organism here. And in this particular, um, you probably can't see this very well at the back of the room, but each of these two hyphae are from different spores. And you can see one has its nuclei colored white and this one has its nuclei colored dark blue. I mean, they're not like that in real life in terms of being color coded as to different types, of course, but that's just to show that these are two different um, genetically distinct organisms here, two different haploid hyphae. And they grow along here and then um, they produce pheromones, these uh, sexual attracting um, hormones that, that draw these hyphae together of different mating types. They don't just have male and female hyphae. There's a lot of different mating types in fungi and compatible mating types get together and um, they fuse their cytoplasm. And here you can see where the fusion occurred. And now we have this dikaryotic mycelium developing. Each one of the partitions here has one nucleus from one parent and another nucleus from the other parent. The bulk of these mycelia underground, these big, you know, they can get to be huge and ancient, are dikaryotic. So the fertilization process is only really halfway during most of the, the life cycle of the fungus. Um, the fungus is, um, the main body of the fungus 
has undergone plasmogamy, the fusion of cytoplasm, but not karyogamy, the fusion of the nuclei. And then we get finally the production of the fruiting body, the basidiocarp here, which is dikaryotic throughout. And then if you were to cut this cap down uh, longitudinally here and look at it uh, along the cut surface, you'd see these gills. Not all basidiomyces have gills. They have different kinds of surfaces, but usually a really extensive surface area on which you get the production of these basidia right here. You see this club-shaped or what's been conceived as a club-shaped thing. This is a specialized cell out along the periphery of these gills where we get the fusion of the two nuclei. And it's only in those cells that we get the fusion of the nuclei to produce a zygote. And then that immediately undergoes meiosis inside this basidium to produce the sexual spores that are haploid. And you can see that they're protruded out on these little peg-like appendages out at the tip. There are four of those for each of the four products of meiosis. And then we get germination of those spores and we start over again. So there's a really long extended period under wi long during which um, we have uh, fertilization really incomplete in fungi. Okay, so now I want to make a few notes about the importance of fungi in ecosystems. And in our day-to-day -day lives, we've already talked a bit about this with mycorrhizae, which is one type of association between plant roots and fungi, but there's another really common and important association that we see every day if we're looking closely. And these are what are called lichens, if we're out in a natural environment, that is. And a lichen is actually an association between a fungus, usually an ascomycete, and some sort of unicellular photosynthetic alga, a green alga or a cyanobacterium, a prokaryotic photosynthetic unicellular organism. And this is one of those lichens that's been cut in half. And you can see here an ascocarp, the fruiting body of the fungus. And here you can see, and this is, so this is all hyphae in here. And then here you can see the unicellular algae, these green structures that uh, are along the upper surface here, the one closest to light. And so we have photosynthesis occurring within this green alga nourishing the fungus in part with the products of photosynthesis, the sugars. And then the alga is gaining a habitat here. It has sort of a sheltered habitat inside of this fungus where it's being kept moist and it's shielded to some extent from UV radiation. It has its own little home in here where it may be, uh, there's some question as to how much benefit the alga really gets out of this relationship compared to the fungus but it is a symbiosis in any case. And um, it's not considered a, an organism. You ought, but this can be confusing because lichens are given taxonomic names as if they were a discrete organism. But in fact, the two elements of this relationship can be pulled apart and they can reproduce separately. In fact, they, don't, they aren't highly integrated to the point where they can't live without one another typically. But they, um, they do dispersed together asexually in most cases in these what are called ceridia. The name's not important, but they, the um, hyphae um, surrounding some of these algal cells can form little dispersal units that are um, asexual propagules that are dispersed out into the environment. So they can disperse together and get around so the association isn't broken. And these are widespread in our environment. Um, there are various types. The leafy lichens, like you can see here, you've probably seen such things growing on soil. And they're often really important in formation of soils because some of the blue-green bacteria that associate with these fungi to form these lichens are capable of nitrogen fixation. And nitrogen can be very limiting in soils and really important to plant growth and, uh, survival of other organisms. So you can see that the green coloration's from the alga, but the fruiting body here that you can see is an ascocarp. See the depression in here where the asci are formed? That's uh, the bulk of the body is fungal here. So these are what are called folios or leafy lichens. They're also fruticose lichens that produce 
uh, these highly branching structures, this one growing on wood and breaking down wood here. And some of them actually grow on really sterile surfaces, on rock faces, and you've no doubt seen things like this on rocks where the lichen is uh, involved in really the, as pioneers in making this substrate suitable for other organisms, breaking down the rock, and uh, nitrogen fixation may be occurring here and to produce some nutrients, and these things catch some soil that gets blown around, and we get soil formation. So uh, lichens are really important, play an important ecological role in primary succession, and they're really an important association with uh, uh, ecologically for ecosystems in general, as are the mycorrhizae we talked about last time. And we don't have time to go into anything else today, but I'll finish up on fungi, uh, its economic importance, and then we'll get into the algae next time and start checking out uh, photosynthetic organisms.